Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for braving the elements and being here today. How many of you went over the river and through the woods to get here? <laughs> Felt like it, huh? Some of you actually probably did. I look around, and it's always amazing to me on weather weekends, you know, we all have people that drive 30, 40, 70 miles. You know that we have people that drive over 70 miles, some, a, a, a family about 80, one family about 70 miles that come here to church, and uh, several, several in between there, but um, sometimes we've got people who will drive those 50 miles on bad weather days, and we've got people who live just a few blocks away that can't make it. I, I don't know how that works, but... Um, <laughs> Thank you for making the effort to be here today, and uh, I, um, I want to remind you or let you know I, that tonight we begin a new series uh, called Tough Questions, and Pastor Austin is going to be sharing a message tonight uh, just addressing the question, if God is good, why is there evil in the world? So that maybe is a question you've asked, maybe you've tried to answer that or come to grips with that. I encourage you to come back tonight, we're going to be doing that on Sunday nights. This morning we begin a series uh, that we've entitled Red Letters, looking at the words of Jesus uh, in the Bible. Maybe, you, um, maybe you've always wondered what those red letters are, maybe you've got this figured out, some people don't, don't know that, but the red letters, what you read in the Gospels primarily, about 99% of those will be found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, are the actual words of Jesus. So we're going to be preaching some messages, looking at the words of Jesus. Not that Jesus' words are, are more important than the rest of the words in the book. The whole book is good. But we're just kind of focusing on what was the things that Jesus said? What did Jesus tell us? Uh, what did he want us to know? And so that's what we're going to be doing Sunday mornings from now up through uh, Easter. So we're going to conclude this series in Easter. We've got several uh, special services in between. Um, last, last weekend, if you... Um, weren't here i'd encourage you to go back online we had a tremendous time last week we had don triplett who's missionary to el salvador sharing about ministry in el salvador and uh what a what an amazing time we had time around the altar sunday night asking for believing for miracles we had a few testimonies of of healings that have taken place i shared this morning deb ritter had posted on on facebook about uh, a leg that had been hurting her since before thanksgiving and uh, it had just gotten worse throughout her day. It would just get worse to the point where, you know, she said after a few weeks, she thought, I better just go see the doctor because it wasn't getting any better. So she made an appointment for this coming Monday uh, to see the doctor, came Sunday night for prayer, um, woke up Monday morning, and everything, no pain. She didn't say anything till yeah, very good, yeah, absolutely. She didn't say anything on Monday, just kind of holding off, I think, just like, you know, don't, don't want to get too far into this and have to backtrack, but she said she woke up Tuesday morning, no pain. So she posted on Facebook uh, that she had gone to work that day, uh, no pain, went to the gym after, after work that day, no pain, and uh, she was sitting in the early service this morning, still no pain. So I am thankful for, for a God who healed Sherry Whistler, uh, God healed her back, she, Sunday night prayer, she went home Sunday night after uh, for the week, she said she couldn't even stand up straight in the morning service, uh, couldn't even lift her leg, it hurt so bad. I had a hard time lifting her leg, uh, went home Sunday night and was running around the yard with her dog, so, and, is, and is to this day doing well. So I know that there are other things, if, you, if you've got a, a testimony of healing, uh, something that God has done miraculous, not just on Sunday night last week, but I believe, here's what I believe, is that it's not just a one-time event, the, those kind of things God can do any time and wants to do and if it's you know if we express our faith in him he's gonna he's gonna show himself strong in our lives no matter what you face no matter how difficult it might be god is a god of possibilities god is god who is able to do things beyond what our imagination can even in our wildest dreams think god can do that and i know that there are people that need healing mike we're praying for healing for you and uh, believe in god for a miracle for you and uh, so many others that or battle and facing cancer, or whatever the circumstances might be. How many of you this morning say that you, um, you just have a need in your life? It's something that you just need God's touch on your life. It's you or someone in your family that you just need. Hold, hold your hand up and raise it high. See, we, we took time earlier to, to pray for needs, and I know that we always sometimes think, you know what, my situation isn't, isn't you know, that, that difficult or that bad or whatever it might be. But I believe that God is able to and wants to meet us right where we're at. 
So would you, would you just join me right now? If those that raise your hand, would you just raise your hand one more time? And I want to pray. Would you just, you can keep your eyes open while you pray, while we pray if you want to. But just, even if you don't know the names of those people sitting around you, can we just express faith and just trust God that he can even do healing right now, right where you sit, in your pew, Sunday morning, right here, January 19, 2020. God, I just pray that your touch will be upon your people and every hand raised in this room. God, that you would just meet them right where they are. God, you're a God who, who operates and does miraculous things. There's nothing in this world that inhibits you or keeps you from healing. You can do all things. And I pray today, God, that you would meet every situation, every need, every circumstance. Heal, God. Make, uh, make, a, make a way. Tear down walls. Whatever it needs, needs to happen for that answer to prayer to come about. God, we trust you. We know that you have a plan. We know that uh, you have a, a purpose for our lives. And if this is what brings ultimately your purpose, God, we say yes. Would, but would you bring breakthrough into every life? We'll believe in faith, trusting you, God, that you can do this. And it's in your name, the mighty name of Jesus, powerful name of Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's just, this year, let's, let's just continue to believe and put, fix our eyes on Jesus. I encourage you, it's the beginning of the year, and maybe, you, maybe you're not a, a resolution maker, but I, I, we've just been encouraging you to, to make a new commitment to just be consistent and be committed in your walk and your relationship with the Lord. I, I heard a testimony um, yesterday of someone uh, who had been, someone had been in our church who had been praying for someone uh, to be saved, and you know, years of knowing someone and praying for someone, and wasn't wasn't her that led this person to the Lord, but I believe there have been seeds that have been planted along the way, and uh, God miraculously, divinely intervened, and this person gave their life to Jesus, and uh, just miracle beyond miracles of what God can do. So don't give up. Let's put our faith, fix our eyes on Jesus, and let's be committed to following his plan and his purpose for our lives. Let's trust him. Amen. I don't know whose water is up here. Is this what he was drinking last Sunday? Is it holy water? That's good. I'm dry. Water's water, right? Pray for me. I don't know what, I don't know what's going to happen. But I needed that. All right, Pastor Weaver and Susan are in Texas and, uh, visiting family, friends, and enjoying much warmer weather than we have in Iowa. High is today supposed to be two or three? How great is that? Above zero. <laughs> yes, praise the Lord. All right, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. We're starting this series on the red letters, red letters of Jesus. We'll be looking this morning at a parable. <coughs> Jesus often taught in parables. There's many recorded in the, in the Gospels. Parable is a, simply a, a, a story, a word picture, an illustration that demonstrates truth or a spiritual principle or a moral lesson. And Jesus taught in parables. And this is the parable of the soils. Maybe in your Bible it says the parable of the sower. It might even say parable of the seed. It, it's, it goes by all those names. I, I tend to like the parable of the soils, it's just me, because as I look at it, the sower and the seed are the same, they don't change, but there's multiple soils that we're going to be reading about. And I want to just ask you uh, here at the outset of the message to um, just do me a favor today, because I know that if you've grown up in church, when we read this story about the parable of the soils, you're going to say, you're, in your mind you're already thinking, I remember hearing that story when I was in first grade. When I was in second grade in Sunday school, I've heard this story. I've read the story. It's like, how many times can I hear the same story? And, and you're not thinking, I'm just checking out and I'm not going to listen to Pastor Jeff. But I want to just say to, and ask you to do this. Would you just open your heart today and just say, Holy Spirit, what do you want to say to me? What do you want to speak to me today in this parable? Because there's a reason I believe why, why we're starting with this parable. Because I think as I, as I read through scripture, I understand that this is probably the first parable that Jesus taught. 
the very first one. In Mark's account, in Mark chapter 4, it's, this is found in Mark chapter 4, Matthew chapter 13, and here in Luke chapter 8. But in, in Mark's account, in verse 13, Mark 4, 13, this, these are Jesus' words. He says, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? So I think it's important that we, that we're, there's a reason why we started with this one. And so uh, it, while, while you probably know the ins and outs and you know all the different kinds of soils, let it not just be information that's coming to you, but say, God, what is it that you want to speak to me? And what am I to do with what I hear today? And truly, honestly say, God, what are you, how do you want me to respond? What do you want me to take away from this message this morning? Everybody good with that? Luke chapter 8, I'm going to start with verse, verse 4. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path, it was trampled on, and birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And when he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others I speak in parables so that, though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand, which is a quote from Isaiah. This is the meaning of the parable, he says. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in time of testing they will fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. So there are three important parts of this particular parable. One is the sower or the farmer, the one who is scattering the seeds, right? says that he scatters, the sower scatters the seeds. So we've got the sower and we've got the seeds. And we have four different kinds of soil into which the seed fell. So the first thing that we look at is the sower. And in this particular instance, the sower is Jesus himself. So initially, Jesus is the one that's sowing. But the reality is, is anyone who is uh, one who proclaims the word of God, either by preaching or teaching or by witnessing, is also sowing seeds. So many of, all of us in this room can be sowers of seeds. Sowing the gospel. What I'm doing right now, standing up in front of you and opening the word and speaking the word to you, uh, we're sowing seeds. And, and, our, and our hope and prayer always is that as the seeds of the gospel go forth, that it would find a place to take root. This word is life. It's living. It's active. And when it takes root in our lives, it changes us. And it grows us and makes us who he wants us to. To be. So the sower is Jesus, the sower is also us. The seed, he says, is the word of God. Like seed, within a seed, you take a seed of anything, there's potential, there's power, and there's life in a seed. A seed is a seed, and a seed will continue to be a seed. You could have a, a jar full of seeds, and they could sit upon a shelf, and they could sit on that shelf for months, for years, decades probably. And those seeds remain the same, right? Until you take that seed and put it in the ground, and then a transformation takes place, and that seed becomes something transformationally different than what it is. So the seed is the word of God, and the word has life and power. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So the word of God is powerful in our lives. And if the seed is the word of God, then we need the word of God in us 
to do something active and to do something purposeful and to do something powerful in our lives. We go beyond the potential to see the power of God at work in our lives through the seed of the gospel. But seed, like I said, is, is nothing really. It just remains a seed unless it's planted. Jesus' words in John 12, 24, he says, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So this was an agrarian society, uh, agriculture, uh, farming was kind of primarily what happened there. We have uh, uh, some farmers that are part of our church, and, um, and we, we live in Iowa, so we understand a little bit of this, right? Just because we live in Iowa doesn't mean we're farmers. Just because you live in the country doesn't mean you're a farmer. But we understand something about farming and sowing and reaping and planting and all of that. So when a person hears and understands the word, it's like a seed that's planted in our heart. And what happens after that depends on the soil, the nature of the soil. So in this parable, the seed is the same, but the soil is different. The soils, there's the hard path that they walk on in the, in the, in the field. There is the, the rocky soil where the rocks are there and the, the dirt maybe sits on top of the rocks and it's shallow. Uh, there is the thorny patches where the weeds kind of grow up in that, in that um, soil. And then there is the good soil. So the success of the seed and what it produces has really nothing to do with the seed, but it has everything to do with the soil. It has everything to do with where the seed lands. If the landing spot of the seed, it's the landing spot of the seed that determines the productivity of that seed. It's very important and it matters where that seed lands to see the potential of what that seed is going to produce. So we've got the, the sower, we've got the seed, and we've got the soil. And the soil, Jesus said, represents the human heart. The soil that we're talking about is our heart. What is the soil of your heart? How is your dirt? I understand this morning there is a difference between dirt and soil. So if I say dirt instead of soil, soil has all the nutrients. It's the good stuff. Dirt's what gets on your hands that you wash off. How many of you knew that? Wow, I learned that today. Now there's something that, if that's all you take away, hopefully there's something more important than that, but Soil. The soil is our heart. If, if, if it's prepared properly, our hearts, just like a field, it can receive the seed of the word of God and produce a fruitful harvest. So Jesus goes on to describe the four different kinds of soils. And I want to just uh, show a picture up here. This is just a picture of a field in uh, Israel. I've seen pictures of fields where it's flat. This is more of a terraced type of a, of a, of a field, uh, but some are maybe flat, and you'll still see some of the same things. There might be some stones that separate the two fields. They cultivate the, the stones and the rocks out of the soil, and then those stones become like boundary markers between your property and my property. So there's the rocky ground, and there's some area where maybe on the edges where the thorns might grow. Uh, then there's the good soil, uh, and there's the path that they walk on, you know, to get around the field. So all of those soils are represented in, in a picture like this. So just kind of a, a word picture, which is what Jesus is doing here with this parable. He's saying, look, there is a sower, and he's scattering seed. You know, we kind of think of, in Iowa, like planting rows, and there's machines that will just drop seed every so often down this very uh, straight row that's guided by GPS to to get the field planted. There's nothing like this in what he's talking about. He's talking about the sower is scattering seed. So I don't know if any of you have ever done this, broadcast seeding, maybe like grass in your yard, where you don't take one of those spreaders and do this kind of a thing, but you've got a sack on your side, and you just reach your hand in, and, and it's kind of like, like this. Anybody ever done that? Okay. Scattering the seed. So the sower is scattering the seed. And when you scatter like that, if you're going to plant like that, you've got to know that it's going to go a lot of different places. 
primarily you've got good soil, but it's going to go a lot of different places. And Jesus is using the picture of that field to say the seed goes a lot of different places. A lot of different kind of soils. The first is the path. It's the hard ground. And it represents a hard heart that refuses to receive. It refuses to believe the message of Jesus. So because it is so hard and it's so packed down, there's no opportunity for the, for the soil to receive the seed because it's so hard. As Jesus um, expounded on this, he said, it just kind of lays there on the ground and what happens is it gets walked on and crushed or the birds come along and, and pluck up the seeds. It becomes food and it finds no place to take root. It's the hard heart. It's the hard ground. It's the path. Then there's the rocks, which is, uh, represents the shallow soil. So maybe in between the rocks, and I, I, this happened in my house this year, uh, there was a, an unusually large amount of those little helicopter things that come from maple trees. Did, did that happen at your house too? They were everywhere. I have one maple tree, and, uh, but the, all along the, my house where the garage is, it's cement up against the cement foundation, and there's that little piece of whatever expansion joint that's there, and seeds got down in there, and I had this whole roll of maple trees that grew about that tall and just stopped. They kind of stayed green, for, I, and I should have plucked them, I guess. I just kind of let them there. They kind of look nice, you know, just, but maple trees that grew that tall and just stopped. You know, there was nothing for it to dig down into to get roots to be able to produce more fruit on the top. And that's kind of the picture he's talking about with the rocky soil is that the, the, it, it's shallow. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's the person that hears the word and they receive it. It says they, they receive it with joy. They're excited to hear this. But they leave that, that situation or they leave, leave that opportunity and they don't do anything about it. So that it, it it comes up right away, but the roots are shallow, and the sun comes out, and there's no water, and it just dries up and withers. That's the, the rocks or the shallow soil. Then there's the thorns. It's, it represents the crowded soil. It's actually really good soil. It's part of the good soil. But what happens is, you know, there's, there's good soil where good seed is planted, but then the thorns come in and they crowd it out. This ground is good. It's ideal for growing, but a lot of other things have come in and taken up the space. All kinds of different weeds and different things have grown into the space, and what they do is they choke out the seed that's there. These are the, the worries of life, the pleasures of life, all these things that crowd in and take our time and don't leave room for God in our lives represented by the thorns that choke out the good seed. And then there's the good soil. The good soil is those that, that hear the word, they retain it, and they actually do something with it. They put it into practice. Even though life gets tough, seed sown in the good soil finds that even though, though through those difficult times of trials, there's growing that happens in trials. When the storms come, they bring rain, which is good for the seed. And, you know, the wind that comes, sometimes trees that grow where, where it's really windy probably are putting their roots farther down in the ground because it needs more stability to hold the, the, the part that's, that's sticking up above the ground. So even in the trials, it can rejoice because what's happening is through all of that, it's producing fruit exponentially more. Jesus said, uh, producing fruit a hundred times more than what was sown. And so it's productive soil. There may be people here this morning, and you're saying something like this. As you think about this, you say, that's all good, but God, God's word doesn't seem to work that way in my life. You see, I'm here, and I hear the word preached. I hear the word taught. Um, I'm here every Sunday or as much as I can be, but it just doesn't seem like anything's different. It doesn't seem to be working for me. If God's word doesn't seem to be working, then what we need to do is check the soil. The problem is not with the seed, it's the soil that the seed landed on. You see, where the seed lands determines what the seed does, and so we have to investigate the nature of the soil in which the seed landed. The soil is our heart, and so we ask this question today, what is the condition of my heart? 
what kind of soil is our hearts? Jesus describes these different kinds of soil and what happened with each one of them. And at the end of that, in verse number, um, verse number 9, I believe it is, verse number 8, when he said this, he called out. It says that in the New Living Translation. It says that in the NIV. I'm not sure what it says in your translation, but it says that he called out, meaning I think that it was more not just speaking, but it was, he was broadcasting his voice. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. So he does this teaching, and then he calls out, if you have ears to hear, let them hear. Hear what I'm saying. So what he's saying is, it doesn't matter what age you are, it doesn't matter what background, what your social status is, it doesn't matter if you have ears. How many of you have ears today? He's saying, anybody that has ears, listen to what I'm saying. Set up and take notice, take note of what I'm getting ready to say. Here's what he's saying. It's possible to have an ear and not hear. It's possible to have two ears and still not be hearing. Any wives in the room? All of you understand when I say um, that you maybe have had a situation where um, you're talking and uh, someone's not hearing what you're saying, and you say, you're not listening to me, and they may respond, I've heard every word that, you, that you've said. And they may even repeat back what words that you said, but you still know, even though they were hearing you, they weren't really listening it's one thing to be able to say the words back, but does, it, does that mean anything to you? Is it, is, it, is it catching on? Do you understand what I'm really saying? So the crowd here obviously liked Jesus. They liked his teaching because everywhere he went, he drew huge crowds. But they weren't hearing him. Even, they were, even though they were in the place where he was, they were hearing him, but they weren't hearing him. That's why he said, if you have ears to hear, hear. There were people in the crowd that day, they were part of that crowd that day who heard the story of what Jesus is teaching, but they still didn't know what was going on. Even the disciples said, tell us the meaning of the story. We want to know the meaning of the story. You know, it's possible uh, to come to church to hear a sermon and not really hear anything at all. That's why I said to you beforehand, you've heard this story, you've heard this parable, it's like wah, 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 because you know all about it. But the reality is, God can speak to you today, and the seeds are being cast out. What kind of soil is it going to land on? Because what happens today? How are you going to respond to what you hear? What are you going to do about it? Listen to the Holy Spirit. But it matters the condition of your heart. What's the soil of your heart? What is it like? Is it able to receive the seeds so that it can take root and grow in you? So the crowd obviously liked Jesus, like I said, but they weren't hearing him. Verse 9, the disciples ask, what does this parable mean? What do you mean? What do you want us to, what do, you want us to do with what you're saying? And in verse 10, he says this, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. You see, the crowd is not getting what I'm talking about, but to you, it has been granted to get in on the secret, to get in on the mystery of the kingdom of God. There's, there's things that the world doesn't know, and so I'm teaching in these stories so that people can grab hold of it, but they're just hearing a neat little story. But here you are, you've asked, what does this mean? What are we supposed to do with this? And he says, to, to, uh, to you, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom have been given. Matthew chapter 13, this, in Matthew's account of this parable, uh, gives us a little bit more insight. I want to turn over to Matthew chapter 13. And this is what Matthew says. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Just what we heard in Luke. But then he goes on and says this. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. 
Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. And this is from Isaiah chapter 6. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For the people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. So in the message that God gave to Isaiah, he realized that these people's hearts were hardened. And though someone was speaking, they weren't listening. And by seeing, they still weren't really seeing what was going on, because their hearts were hard. The soil of their hearts wasn't even open to receive. They, they had their ears turned on, but they weren't listening. It's possible to sit here in church today, and you hear me speaking, you hear me preaching, but you may walk out of the door today, and from, from this place to the car, forget completely what you've heard. That's what he's talking about. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. God, what is it that you are speaking? What is it that you are saying? You see, our ears can hear many things, but there's a deeper kind of listening that results in spiritual understanding. Jesus wasn't hiding truth from these people. He wasn't hiding truth from sincere speakers or sincere seekers. Those who were, who were receptive understood the story, but to the rest of them, this was just a neat little, neat little thing. Oh, yeah, that's a great story, Jesus, all about farming. We get that. I, I totally understand that. It's so cool. What does it mean? That's what the disciples asked. What does this mean? You see, the crowd showed up. And as, and as Matthew says, these people's hearts have become callous. They hardly hear with their ears and they have their eyes closed. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and they might hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. So the crowd showed up. They came broken. They came hurting. They came bruised. They came struggling with life and they didn't get healed. They didn't get better. Why? Because they came with ears, but they refused to hear. They came with their eyes, but they refused to see. They came with their hearts, but they refused to understand and it's because of the state with which they came that keeps God from fixing them even though they show up there's a lot of us that are guilty of just showing up at church we just show up and we go through our routine and we might even say like I said earlier the word of God just isn't working the sermons don't seem to fix anything in my life you know, they're great stories. I, I, like, all the, I like all the preachers. It's, it's, it's great to be around the crowd, and I love the worship. And you might even say, church was just awesome today. It was a great message. But if we forget about it by the time we get to the parking lot, or by later today, you're going, what was, the, what was that message about? And we haven't contemplated, we haven't retained anything, because if we haven't retained anything, then we're not putting anything into practice. James says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. It depends on the condition of our heart. Is the soil of our heart open and fertile to receive the word so that it can take root and grow in us? How many of you like appetizers? You like the appetizers. Maybe you've been on a cruise and, or you've been to a fancy restaurant and there's multiple rounds of food that come your way. The appetizer comes and it's just a small portion, um, but, we, but we love the appetizers. Some of you um, understand what I say when I say half price appetizers at Applebee's. You ever gone to Applebee's after nine o'clock? Appetizers, most of them are half price. Some of you go do that at nine o'clock at night and get a meal because you order two or three of them because they're cheap. But we love appetizers. I don't know what your favorite appetizer is. If it's mozzarella cheese sticks or chips and dip or wings or whatever it might be. But we like, we like the appetizers. Here's the deal with the appetizer. Like I said, it's just meant to set up the meal. It's the initial little thing to get us started with 
with the real meal, the entree. But here's the thing. If you're satisfied with an appetizer, if the appetizer is all that you want and you feel that the appetizer is all that you need, then you don't care one thing about the entree. It's just the appetizer. You're not going to get an entree if you're satisfied with the appetizer. I want you to hear this. A sermon that's preached is nothing more than an appetizer. What you're getting here today is not the full meal deal. What you hear today in this message is just an appetizer. Any sermon that you hear, no matter how much you like it, no matter matter how much you enjoy it, no matter how long it is, and no, I'm not preaching eight or nine hours this morning, but I did go long in the early service. No matter how long it is, no matter how short and sweet it is, no, no matter how good it was, even the best sermon by Pastor Hawkins is nothing more than an appetizer. Sorry, Pastor Hawkins. But it's true. The disciples said, we want the full meal deal. It really wasn't the words that they, that they used. They just said, what does all this mean? And what they were saying is, what am I supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? How does what you just said affect my life? Or is it just a cute little story? I think there's more to this. How do we get a handle on, on what you're saying so that we're able to pick it up and do something with it? That's what they were asking. They weren't satisfied with the sermon. The problem is a lot of us are very satisfied with the sermon. Most Christians, I think, are. To see the crowds following Jesus loved the appetizers, but the disciples wanted more. He said the knowledge and the secrets, the mysteries of the kingdom of God have been given to you. They've been given to those who aren't satisfied just to be part of the religious crowd or just to be doing the Christian thing. Jesus begins explaining the meaning of, uh, to the disciples uh, who wanted to know more. In Luke chapter 8, verse 11, he says, The seed is the word of God. We know the, the soil is our heart to receive the seed, but the seed is the word of God. So when the word of God comes to us, it's in seed form. Okay, so imagine an acorn. Or because Jim is a farmer out here, I'm going to imagine a, 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 a grain of A kernel of corn. What is that kernel of corn? What happens to it when you stick it in the ground and you water it a little bit? It begins to grow. When that seed gets in the soil, and I have a little picture because it's just easy for us to picture. Jesus is talking about pictures. See, the seed goes in, and then what happens in the ground? That seed would never have done that just sitting on a shelf. But when it goes in the soil, it begins to sprout. It takes root. Roots grow down, and the fruit goes up. And that kernel of corn turns into a a stalk of corn. And that will have an ear of corn, maybe two ears of corn, that each have maybe about 800 kernels of corn. That's a pretty good return on your investment. One kernel becomes 800 kernels on one ear of corn. But it had to go into the ground, and it had to die in order for it to to do that. God's word comes to us in seed form. You see, an acorn or a kernel of corn, the acorn is not an oak tree. The kernel of corn is not a a stalk of corn producing another ear of corn. But within that seed, it has the potential, it has the design, it has the DNA to become something else. That acorn will become an oak tree when it's planted in the ground in good soil. So in order for that acorn to be an oak, it must be planted in the good soil. The seed is not the full-grown expression of what can become. What it can become is wrapped up into that seed, located in that seed, all the potential to become something else. So when we come to church, or when we read our Bible, or when we're in a Bible study, or, or, or whatever it might be, we get the seed. But if the soil isn't consistent... That seed is not going to find a good place to grow. It has to cooperate with the nature of the seed so that it become what it was designed to be. Every tree, every fruit, every plant started with a seed. And so God's word is the seed. And that seed only develops because of the soil. 
It's nothing to do with the seed. It has everything to do with the soil where it's planted because the seed is the word of God. That seed is perfect. This is what Psalm 19, verse 7 and 9 says. The law of the Lord, the word of God, is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. The word of God is the seed in the story, and it's perfect. It's a perfect seed that needs some perfect soil to take root and produce fruit in our lives. But we have to ask, what is the soil? The problem isn't the seed, it's the soil, because the soil can become damaged. James 1.21 says, therefore get rid of all moral filth. Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. That's, that's, that word is worth repeating. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth, anything that's going to choke out the seed, the good seed. Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Then that very next verse says, don't merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. Just being a listener, just hearing and doing nothing about it, we're deceiving ourselves. James says, do what it says. Put it into practice. Let it take root in your life so that it can produce fruit in you. Humbly accept the word planted in you. Psalm 92, verse 12. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. I know we don't have palm trees in Iowa. But you know that palm trees can live at least 100 years old? I don't know that I want to live to be 100 years old, but this is saying, look, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree that will last a really long time. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. The cedars in Lebanon can grow up to 120 feet tall. I think even the tallest oak trees in our area are maybe 60 feet, 70 feet tall. But the cedars in Lebanon, 120 feet tall, about 30 feet in circumference. They're big, they're huge, they're pla- and it says, planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. The righteous flourish when they're planted in the house of the Lord. Psalm 1, verse 1, and 1 through 3. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Can you see that a seed planted in good soil, in the right soil, in the right place, in the right spot, is going to produce fruit? Even into old age, it's going to stay green, it's going to flourish, it's not going to perish, it's not going to wither, but its roots go down deep where all the nutrients are so that it can grow strong and become what God designed it to be in the first place. Not like those little maple trees that grew this tall and just withered and died. I want to be like this. I want to be that kind of person. Hebrews says the word of God is alive. I already read this to you. It's alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Here's the thing. The word is alive. The seed of the word is alive. Seed is living. Because I know that no matter how long it's been sitting on the shelf, once that thing gets planted, it's going to produce roots and grow fruit and it's going to flourish. The same way the word of God is alive, it's energized like a seed. You don't see the, the tree, you don't see the fruit, the plant, but it's in the seed. And in the seed of the word, there is so much life and there's so much potential. The only reason the seed wouldn't grow is because of the soil. And so we just ask the question, what's the condition of our soul? What's the soil of your heart? 
And the question that I asked on the slide is, how is your dirt? Full of rocks? Shallow? I just show up? Doesn't really do anything in my life? Keep showing up. I like the stories. I like the people. I like the sermon. Are we satisfied with the appetizer? Or are we looking for the full meal deal? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. And I asked you earlier just to listen to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. How do you respond? What do I do with what I just heard? I think we always have to ask ourselves that. When we, when we read the word, when we hear the word. God, what do you want me to do with what you just told me? He was telling the crowd that day that the words that I'm speaking are life. And he illustrated it with this agricultural picture of a farmer scattering seed on different kinds of soil. They didn't even understand it. But the disciples knew there had to be more. I'm asking this morning, how many of you here are saying, I just want more? I'm not going to be satisfied with just being a church attender. I'm not going to be satisfied with just hearing the word. I want it to grow in me. I want there to be fruit in my life. Jesus had a lot to say about trees and the fruit on the tree. Our life needs to be producing fruit. And in order for it to produce fruit, it's got to take deep root so that the tree, the plant, can grow and make fruit. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed here tonight, today. How many of you just say, the soil of my heart needs to change? I feel like there's some rocks that need to be cultivated out of my heart. I feel like I've let some cares of life and some of the pleasures of life kind of take root and it's choking out the real thing it's not like God has asked you to sacrifice anything he's just saying let your heart that is so easy to become hardened and not to hear you're hearing but you're not really hearing you're hearing but you're not perceiving and understanding and today you say things in my heart need to change with your heads bowed and your eyes closed how many of you say that's me soil of my heart things need to change you need God to come in and just turn the dirt to run the tiller so to speak through the soil to soften it up to get the rocks out and to do some weeding and some pulling of weeds and getting some things out that have kind of crept their way in see the enemy is out sowing seeds of weeds there's a story that Jesus tells in Matthew 13 about the farmer who sowed his seed in his field and went to bed that night and his enemy came and scattered seeds of weeds in the field. Didn't even know it. I think that's what happens to so many of us. Life happens and begins to choke out what God wants to do in our life. Father, I pray for every hand raised in this room. God, that you would do a work in our hearts so that your word, the seed of your word, the seeds that you distribute to us would be able to find place to take root in our life and, and bring transformation and, and bring fruit in our life. That it would be evident of what's in our heart because your word says that out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks out of the abundance of our heart. It shows the fruit of our life. We know the, the tree by the fruit that's hanging on the tree pray that we would just listen to your Holy Spirit and that we would do a, a spiritual inventory of our life and see if there's any fruit or what is the fruit does my life bring honor to him does my life glorify my father the creator the one who gave his life for me 
Lord, we examine our hearts today and ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, that we wouldn't just be hearers this morning and just let it fall on deaf ears, and by the time we leave and we get in our car and we go home, we're on to something else and we're never thinking about it again. Lord, what do we do? I pray that we'd be obedient to do what you ask us to do. Not to be like that person in James that's like looking in a mirror and they see what needs to change, but then they walk away and forget what they saw. May your word take root in our life because our heart is fertile to receive the seed of your word to grow in us and change us and make us who we need to be. Is that your desire? That Jesus Christ will be magnified in you, meaning he looks bigger in your life than maybe he seems right now. You know how that happens? Our heart just becomes soft and open and fertile to receive the seed so that it can take root and grow and produce fruit in us fruit that we can't make ourselves it's just the fruit of the spirit of God that's in us Paul talks about the fruits of the spirit right it's the evidence of what's gone on in our life a life that's been touched that's been changed that's been transformed that doesn't happen when your heart is like the walking path let's not let our hearts get hard Let's not let the cares of life become like weeds in our life that grow and choke out God's word in our our life. How many of you are challenged a little bit today? The story from your Sunday school years becomes something that is foundational. Jesus said, if you don't understand this, then you're not going to understand any of the other parables. You're not going to understand all the other words. It's because... We need to be able to receive the seed of the word. This morning there might be someone here, standing here, and you've never given your heart and life to Jesus. Maybe you have, but you just feel like you've been going through the motions. And he'd say, you know what, I want my life. I want my life to be controlled and led by Jesus tired of living my life the way I want to live it and doing my own thing. Is there anyone here? I know you're looking around. I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes again. Here's what I think. If there's someone here and that's you, God will change your life beginning today. It's like instantly what I think he does is just like pour water on the soil of your heart and it just becomes soft. And like this person who became a Christian recently, it's like something, something transformationally changed and their nature changed. Nobody was telling her what to do. It's just God revealing himself. That's what we need. Is there anyone here today you'd say, I need, I need Jesus in my life. I want to invite Jesus into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. Is there anyone just looking around the room? We're all looking. I don't want that to intimidate you, but here's the thing. Everybody in this room is for you. Everybody in this room is for you, and Jesus is for you. He gave his life so that you could live. If that's you today and you're making that decision, it's just simple of just inviting him into your heart and say, forgive me of my sin, give me new life new life that you offered. You took my place, died in my place so that I could have the opportunity to live. And life changes. Following Jesus changes your life for good. If that's you and you made, made a decision, you're praying that prayer in your heart today, find me. I'll be out here at the door in the foyer out here by the Fresh Start Center. Come and talk to me. I'd love to, or talk to someone at the Fresh Start Center. We'll give you some materials that help you in the next steps.